Good morning, Vintage. What a packed, uh, can we praise God for a packed house this morning? This is awesome. I love it. Hey, by the way, if you are a V-Kid and you haven't gone out yet, you probably saw them leaving, but V-Kids can go ahead and make their way to V-Kids if they are ready. We've got volunteers and leaders at the door. And uh, speaking of, of kids and back to school, super excited and thankful for all the teachers and everybody that works in the school systems, praying for you guys. And I think most of us are, are not going to miss summer because the temperatures have been brutal. So uh, ready for that first fall breeze to hit, whatever that's going to be. Uh, well, hey, turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30. If you don't have a Bible, just raise your hand and uh, Connect Team will give you a free copy of God's Word in English or Spanish as a gift from us to you, Exodus 30. And we have been in a series called Crossover, uh, walking through the book of Exodus. And today I'm excited to kind of finish our series until next fall. So if you've been around for any amount of time, you know, we've been going back and forth through the book of Exodus and walking through it uh, portion by portion. And so we're going we're gonna to sort of take a break after this week and do a brand new series that you'll hear about uh, later in the gathering. And then we will finish Exodus next fall. Can I get a, oh, or a amen? Okay, we've got mixed feelings. It's God's word, right? So we're going to do that. So I'm Matthew Weaver. I'm one of the pastors. We're glad you're here. Uh, excited to share God's word with you in Exodus chapter 30. If you have missed any of the uh, sermons lately that we have preached in the book of Exodus, I want to encourage you. Uh, maybe you're new or you've kind of missed some Sundays this summer. Just go to our website. It's on the screen. Scan that code and, and just catch up on everything we've talked about. Because today we're going we're gonna to pick back up where we left off last week. And today in Exodus chapter 30 through 31, we're going to talk about God giving Israel instructions on putting together what the scripture calls the tent of meeting. Everybody say tent of meeting. Tent of meeting. In other words, the tabernacle, you've heard of that. So God has been giving the nation of Israel instructions as, as they've left slavery. Remember, they were enslaved by the Egyptians. God led them out of slavery. God is leading them to the promised land. And along the way, God is giving them specific instructions on what to do next as a nation. And so last week we talked about the priest. I was really hoping Dustin would dress up as a priest, but he didn't. Maybe one day we'll get to see that. But we talked about all the things the priest wore and what those things meant and the, the symbolism that came with that. Today is going to be very similar as we look at the tent of meeting and all the specific instructions that God gave the nation of Israel for putting this area together. And this area was very important. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to break down some details in these two chapters about this area and the significance of these elements of the tent of meeting. And then we're going to pull out some application for us today. I want you to take notes. Today, I'm going to walk through two chapters and we're going to walk through this fairly quickly. So try to lock in, try to take notes and, and then I would encourage you to really process this throughout the week in more detail. Here's our main idea this morning. This is kind of going to set the tone for everything. The main idea is that God is in the details. God is in the details. And here's the flow I want you to think about throughout the sermon. Details bring order. And order brings peace. God is in the details. We're going to read about this today. You can think about your own life, God's work through your life, and things around you and the details that maybe you never would have imagined that God cared about. He cares about the details. And details bring order, and order brings peace. Raise your hand if you want peace in your life. Every hand should be up. Maybe you need more coffee. We all want peace. So with that being said, how does... How, does, how do these ideas relate to this story in Exodus 30 through 31? I want you to go to chapter 30, and I want you to lock in on verses 1 through 7 first. We're going to read a lot of scripture this morning, because so I want you to, to lock in, and I'm going to give you a few things along the way. I want to ask the question this. As God gave Israel these instructions on the tent of meeting, what did God tell them to do? Number one, here's the first thing. They were to prepare the altar. Prepare the altar. Look at verses 1 through 7 of chapter 30. God says, 
You shall make an altar on which to burn incense, and you shall make of it acacia wood. A cubit shall be its length and a cubit its breadth. It shall be square and two cubits shall be its height. Its horn shall be, should be of one piece with it and you shall overlay it with pure gold, its tops and around its sides and horns, and you shall make a molding of gold around it. You shall make two golden rings for it. Under its molding on two opposite sides of it, you shall make them. And they shall be holders for poles with which to carry. And you shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put it in front of the veil that is above the ark of the testimony, in front of the mercy seat above the testimony, where I will meet with you. And Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on it. There's a lot going on there, a lot of details, right? They were to prepare the altar. Let me get, show you a couple of pictures that may help us first. So on the screen, you'll see two pictures. Number one, you see a picture of the tent of meeting area zoomed out. So as you can kind of get an idea of what this looked like for the nation of Israel, God gave them instructions on how to literally put this together. There was an outer courtyard they went into. There's different things happening in the courtyard. And then the other picture is a zoomed in picture of the tent. And in the zoomed in picture, you see two sections. You see one section that's a little bit bigger that has some, some things there. And then you see a curtain. The curtain separated the holy place from the most holy place. And as we, as we talk about the altar, preparing the altar, the altar is sitting right there, that gold thing right in front of the curtain. That's the altar that they were to prepare. Now, on this altar, let me tell you what happened. The altar of incense was to be placed right where it was, separating the holy place from the most holy place. It was made of wood and overlaid with pure gold. It was three feet high and a foot and a half feet wide. And so what was to happen was Aaron would go into the tent and each morning and each evening, he would offer the correct incense on the altar. And once a year, he would go into that as well and offer the blood of the sin offering of atonement. He would bring sacrifices and offering to the Lord on behalf of the nation of Israel. This was important, right? This is how in the Old Testament sins were atoned for. Thank God we're in the new covenant, right? <laughs> in Jesus. But this is what they did in the, old, in the Old Testament before Jesus came. This is how they atoned for their sins. Aaron or a priest would go in and do these things on behalf of the whole nation to provide forgiveness of sins. The presence of God would come, cleanse them of their sins. So you can see why the altar was so important. Preparing the altar mattered. Now let's think of a question for us today. Completely different context, I get that, but the idea of an altar still relates to us today. The question for us is how are you preparing your altar? Think about this. In Christ, in the new covenant, if you have the Holy Spirit, you should be striving to live your life as an altar. Like literally, you are a sacrifice to the Lord. You are pouring out your life, your heart, everything about yourself to God and saying, God, take me here I am. My life is yours. You've saved me. You've set me apart. In return, I give this to you. Your, your life is an altar, right? And that's true. But also for many of us, especially I'm like this, we may need a, a actual physical place to go to more often than not that represents for us sacrifice and surrender. Yes, you know, if you grew up in church, you're familiar with come down to the altar, right? You know, and that's this right here. This is, there's nothing holy, magical, anything about this section, but it's a symbol of coming down and saying, God, take, take me, I'm yours. For me, I like to get outside and get away somewhere where I can blot out the noise and get the distractions out of my head and focus on God. For me, that's nature where I really feel like I'm in tune with the Lord and all the distractions are going away and I can focus on his presence. And there's a level of complete honesty and transparency that I believe I give to God when my distractions are taken away. And so, yes, your life is an altar, but think about it. Do you have a place? Do you need to prepare a place to be completely open and honest with God? Let him heal you and forgive you. So yes, prepare the altar. Number two, 
They were to give back to the Lord and trust him alone. I want you to look at verses 11 through 14 in chapter 30. The Lord said to Moses, when you take the census of the people of Israel, then each shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord when you number them, that there be no plague among them when you number them. Each one who is numbered in the census shall give this, half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary, half a shekel as an offering to the Lord. Everyone who is numbered in the census from 20 years old and older shall give the Lord's offering. Give back to the Lord and trust him alone. First of all, they were to take a census. Taking a census is the same thing as counting each person. Taking attendance, teachers, right? Are you here today, right? Counting each person in the nation of Israel. And with the nation of Israel, there were so many people that there was a temptation and a tendency for the nation of Israel to not depend on the Lord. We've read that countless times, right? Because there was such a large group of them, there was a tendency to say, no, there's so many of us, we can do this. We don't need the Lord. We don't need his presence. We don't need intimacy with him. We can handle this with our massive multitude of people. And so what God is saying here is, look, number one, count everybody. Every person matters. Number two, if they're 20 or older and they're able to to give, right? I want every single person to give the same amount to the work, half a shekel. And this is interesting because this puts every single person on the same level. No one is exempt from this. No one is better than anybody. God says everybody who's 20 or older is going to give this amount to the work of the tent of meeting. They're going to give back to the Lord, and as they give back, they are demonstrating that they are trusting me above anything else because they're giving. They're not holding on to, and they're freely giving what I'm asking them to give, and they can trust that what I'm asking them to give, I'll use. Question for us is, are you giving back to the Lord? Israel was to see themselves as a people that desperately needed God to do what he's called them to do. In the new covenant today, it's not so much about equal giving. What's it about? Equal. If if you've been around enough, you hear us say that when we do the, the, the giving moment at the end of our gathering, where we give financially back to the work that God's doing. We say, look, it's not about equal giving. It's about equal sacrifice because all of us make different, amount, different amounts of money. So if we were to say in this new covenant today, Jesus has come, right? What we're, we're giving back, it's not so much about, hey, everybody in this church needs to give $100 every week. That's not the point. Remember in the New Testament, Jesus was pleased when the poor person gave out of their lacking rather than the rich person giving out of their abundance. Why was he pleased with that? Because their heart was in a posture of dependence. And they didn't have a lot, but what they had, they trusted God with. And so for us, as we get back to the Lord, we need to trust. Giving is an act of trust, isn't it? It's a letting go of control. But if you have given to God's work throughout your life, you can testify that God has always been faithful and he's always provided and he's done more with what you've given than what you could do holding on to that gift, right? So give back to the Lord and trust him alone. Number three, they were to approach the Lord carefully. They were to approach the Lord carefully. Look at uh, verses 17 through 21. Verses 17 through 21. The Lord said to Moses, Uh, You shall also make a basin of bronze with its stand of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it with which Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and feet. When they go into the tent of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister to burn a food offering to the Lord, they will wash with water so that they may not die. They shall wash their hands and their feet 
so that they shall not die. It shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his offspring throughout their generations. Approach the Lord carefully. So Aaron and his sons, as they went in to make these sacrifices, they needed to be cleansed and washed themselves. Outside, in the, out, in the outer courtyard area, remember the picture, there was a bronze basin. And in that bronze basin was water. And this was an area for them to wash, their, wash themselves, right? Because sin and God do not coexist. And so the scripture says, so they shall not die. It might sound very extreme, but we need to be reminded how much the holiness of God is and how bad sin is. And when those two things come together, that's the beautiful news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? But when those two things come together, those things aren't meant to come together. So God is saying, before you come in and atone for the sins of the people, you first need to cleanse your, be cleansed of your own sins. And so they were to wash themselves as a symbol. God was involved in that process as a symbol of being cleansed before they came into the holy presence of God. Question for us is how do you approach the Lord? They were to approach the Lord carefully before they did their duties before God. How do you approach the Lord this isn't about being scared of God, okay? <laughs> this is about reverence, adoration, and I believe a healthy fear of God. When we come to worship, when we come to corporate worship, for example, uh, I want you to think about how you approach corporate worship. Vintage Church is a very come-as-you-are church. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? And that's a good thing. But I think what could be dangerous, not just here but anywhere, is that we come as we are so much in a way that we don't come in a reverence to God. I'm trying to differentiate, differentiate those two things. Come as you are. This isn't about the way you look on the outside. You could come in here wearing a ball cap if you want. There's no judgment. I don't care. Yeah. I don't care if you have tattoos. I don't care. It doesn't matter. This is a come-as-you-are church. That's great. But also, let me ask you another question. Even if you come in here and you've had a rough week and you may be struggling and you don't look the best, how's your heart? Even if your heart is broken, do you come in complete brokenness before God? This isn't about your outward appearance. This is about your heart. And I just think there's a tendency sometimes in our culture today, not just here, anywhere, where you, you don't come with expectation to worship. And there's just, it's just a habit. It's just a routine. It's just something you do. You don't think about what you're doing. You don't think about the lyrics that we're singing. When we take communion, confessing your sins, all these things that we are that we need to just, I believe, take a step back and say, God, I'm coming as I am, but I'm coming because I need you. Not because I have to be here. Because you don't have to be here. You could be doing anything else. And so it's a tough thing for me to try to describe because we want to come as we are to the cross, right? That's the gospel message. But we also want to come approaching the Lord with a broken and contrite heart, in dependence of him, understanding that we need him, and letting him work in our hearts. So how do you approach the Lord? I believe we should approach the Lord carefully. Next thing, Israel was to consecrate. Consecrate. Verses 22 through 30. Look at those verses. The Lord said to Moses, take the finest spices, liquid myrrh, uh, 500 shekels, sweet smelling cinnamon. I love cin cinnamon stuff. What about y'all? I would have enjoyed this part. Sweet smelling cinnamon, half as much as that. 250, 250 of uh, cane, 500 acacia, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, a hen of olive oil, 
uh, you shall make of these a sacred anointing oil blended as by the perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. And with it, you shall anoint the tent of meeting and the ark of the testimony and the table and all its utensils and the lampstand and its utensils and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering and its utensils and the basin and the stand. Consecrate these things that they may be most, what? Holy. Whatever touches them will become, what? You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may serve me as priests. Okay, tons of details, right? They were to consecrate. Consecrate means to dedicate or set apart. To dedicate or set apart. The anointing oil and incense that we read about was to literally cover everything inside the tent that was going to be touched. Everything that was going to be used for atonement of sin and worship and sacrifice was to be covered with this oil. And it was to be covered. It was a very specific oil made of only specific things, usually used only for this specific purpose. And so they were to cover it as an act of consecration for the purpose of what they did inside the tent. I want you to think about the word consecrate, not a word that we use too often, but the concept makes sense. Have there been moments in your life where you have set things apart for something? You've, you've dedicated something or set it apart to point to something that's happened. For me, I think about one, one example out of many is when I got ordained as a pastor. That was a very special moment in my life that I'll never forget. But it was like an hour long of something that pointed to something that God was doing in my life. Setting me apart for ministry, right? The, the actual ordination it wasn't just about the ordination, although it had significant meaning. I was set apart. I was prayed over. I was affirmed, all those things. But it was about what God was already doing in my life leading up to that moment. And it carried a significant meaning for me. And it was like a consecration. And I think for us, if you know Jesus this morning, one thing you should think of immediately is your baptism. We're going to have a baptism today and celebrate that. And when we celebrate baptism, baptism is kind of like a consecration for us. Where when you get baptized, you are getting baptized because you have surrendered your life to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that baptism is a public expression of what has happened in your life. And it's a ceremony. It's a setting apart. It's a showing your church family, showing the Lord that you are unashamed to follow Jesus. And it's a celebration. And it's set apart for that specific purpose. So with that being said, I want you to think about this question. How often do you go back to your baptism? Some of you are looking at I remember your baptism. And I don't look at you and think about your baptism and just think, eh, whatever. <laughs> no big deal. I remember y'all's baptisms, right? I mean, I could just, I could call out names. We were there, we celebrated. It meant something, didn't it? So the question for you is, does it still mean the same thing? Because baptism is a one-time thing, but it's extremely significant because it's, God commanded it. We see it all throughout the New Testament, but it's a reminder that you follow Jesus. So in the moments that you're struggling to follow Jesus, which are bound to happen, one thing you should do is go back to your baptism. Go back to when you trusted in Christ. How often do you go back to your baptism? These things help anchor you and then even live. It's that covenant, right? You go back to it. Number five, Israel was to 
be empowered to work. They were to be empowered to work. Go to verses 1 through 6. Chapter 31, verses 1 through 6. The Lord said to Moses, See, and by the way, I'm going to butcher a lot of these names, so please don't judge me. See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, knowledge and craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, bronze, cutting of stones, carving wood, to work in every craft. And behold, I've appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan. And I've given to able men the ability that they may make all that I have commanded you. Be empowered to work. I love this because, once again, God is in the details. <laughs> He's calling out people by name. He's telling them what their gift is. He's telling them what he wants them to do. And he's getting as specific as knowledge, craftsmanship, artistic designs, gold, silver, bronze, cutting stones, carving wood. I mean, he is getting very detailed with those specific people that he knows are gifted in that way. And that's a beautiful thing. Everybody had a part to play. And this is just one part of the bigger story. But as you can see in the picture I showed you, there was a lot of, it wasn't just a quick, quick build. I mean, there was a lot of details and beautiful things that needed to be put together. He empowered them to use their gifts for a greater purpose. Here's your question. Are you using your gifts for God's kingdom? 1 Corinthians 12 is a beautiful example in the New Testament of how gifts work together. The Apostle Paul talks about a body, uses an imagery of a body. And when a body, is, when a body part on a body is not functioning at its best, the entire body suffers for it. Right? Think about when you're sick. Think about when you break your arm. Think about this or that, or you've had issues with your body. It's so frustrating because you can't do what you want to do, what you're supposed to do, because something isn't working the way it's supposed to. And I think about Adventist Church, I just want to praise God for everybody who contributes their gift to this church. Because without you using your gift, something would be lacking in our church body. Everybody has a part to play. So for those that aren't using their gifts, that aren't serving, I mean, I just think about a Sunday morning, all the details of this, the Connect team, the production team, the music arts team, the V-Kids team, everything happening behind the scenes that you may never see, those are people using their gifts to create an environment that's welcoming and loving in Christ. I think about fill the fridge. I think about people that come and serve our community. I think about all the things that you do in the community, things that you do to use your gifts. But if you are not using your gifts, this is a challenge for you to pray about that, to talk to somebody, and to see how we can plug you in to use your gifts. Because somebody is, is not benefiting from you using, like, when, you, when we all use our gifts, our needs are met. It's not about our needs just getting met as we show up and do nothing, right? It's about our needs being met because we're all meeting each other's needs. Because it's, that's what the church does. So God has given you a gift. God gave these people specific abilities. I mean, very specific. So think about how has God given you a gift? How do we take that gift and use it for kingdom work? Are you using your gifts for God's kingdom? Something to think about and pray about. Number six, we've made it to the end. Here we go. Israel was to trust God's order. Trust God's order. Look at chapter 31, verses 12 through 14, and then also verse 18. Verse 12, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, You are to speak to the people of Israel and say, Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. That's powerful. Only God sanctifies you shall keep the Sabbath. It is holy for you. 
Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from the people. Verse 18, God said all these things. In verse 18, it wraps up. He says, he gave to Moses all the things he had finished speaking on Mount Sinai. He gave him two tablets of the testimony of stone written with the finger of God. Trust God's order. God's order specifically here is about Sabbath. Work six days, rest one day. God has given us an order to follow. And this goes back to creation, where God created in six days and he rested on the seventh. And this, when we trust God's order, I go back to the text in verse 13. Do this so that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. When you trust God's order, you're reminding yourself that you are not in control and that you are able to rest because God sustains you. His order is beautiful. It is a gift to us. And we can rest because we can trust God. I know that's easier said than done. It takes discipline to get there, but we've got to get there where we're incorporating a rhythm of work and rest into our lives. And ultimately, this is worth following because God did it. I'm reminded in verse 18. I mean, can you imagine being Moses and being given these tablets that literally are written instructions by God's finger? I'm not going to try to explain that because I think that's it's insane. But these are not just like things that God said. These are things that God wrote down and gave to the nation of Israel. They are trustworthy. God is trustworthy and he is giving them, I mean, he didn't have to do this. He could have just told them and he's trustworthy, but he put it down on, on a tablet for them to treasure. I think that's a beautiful thing. The question for us is this, do your rhythms reflect God's order? Do your life rhythms reflect God's order? Hey, you may have to get creative with this. Schedules are nuts but it's worth the work to get there. Our main idea, I'm going to go back to our main idea and give you two closing thoughts. Our main idea was God is in the details. Details bring order and order brings peace. I want to give you two closing thoughts as we've unpacked the, the nation of Israel putting together this tent why this meant that and what, what about the details, we can see that God was intentional with what he told them. It wasn't just random. It had a meaning to it, right? There was order, there was details, and there was peace as they carried these things out. Here's two closing thoughts that we can apply to our life. Number one, order matters corporately. Order matters corporately. God cares about how we worship God cares about how we, how we gather. It matters to him. You know that this service that you're sitting in is not something we wing? <laughs> like, we had a meeting about this service and we put things together. Is that a bad thing? I don't think that's a bad thing. Because order matters to God. Details matter to God. I mean, the book of Colossians says, whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. We have a flow that we follow. We have elements that we put together. We have things that we pray through, we process. We think about when should we do this? When, what should go here? What should go here? But you know you can have both order and freedom at the same time. Because the goal of order is not to restrict freedom in Christ. When you come here, you can worship as, you, as the Lord is leading you. This is a place of freedom. There's freedom in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But there's also a structure that we follow. And it doesn't have to be both and. The Lord works through order. The Lord, the Lord works through freedom. It's within that order that freedom happens. Let me give you an example of this in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 14. Paul is writing to the church of Corinth and there's a bunch of mess going on in a worship service. <laughs> it's a worship service with distractions. Just, you can read it later, 
But there are things happening in this worship service where people are doing things in a way that is distracting everybody else. Bringing more attention to themselves than God. And Paul calls them out in those things. He says, look, this doesn't mean that you can't worship the Lord, but this isn't about you and how you look and what you're saying and what you're doing. This points to Jesus. And so be careful with that. And in uh, chapter 14, verse 33, you'll see it on the screen. Paul says, God is not a God of confusion or disorder. God is a God of peace. So when you come to worship, there should be peace in this place. There is order and freedom at the same time. Order matters corporately. Number two, order matters individually. Remember, details bring order. Order brings what? Peace. You may have lots of chaos in your life. You probably do. You can bring your chaos to God and allow his peace to fill you specifically through the gospel of Jesus Christ. First of all, if you don't know Jesus, you are living in a state of disorder and chaos. Your heart is far from God and you're living in a state of sin. And that's just going to bring confusion to your life. Because you're going to run to different things to try to fill your void. And you're going to realize that none of them work. So Jesus brings order and peace into your life for salvation But secondly, he brings order and peace into your life through the Holy Spirit for daily living. He doesn't just save you and say, good luck. Jesus intercedes on your behalf. He's in heaven. And he sent his spirit to you to go straight to him. And I know some people's lives are extremely complicated. I can't even begin to imagine what's going on. But if you're not bringing it to God and asking him to sort out the mess... You're not going to the right places. Allow God to meet you in that chaos. Work in your heart and life and bring order and peace to you. So order matters corporately. This order matters individually. And let me wrap this up. When we have order in our individual lives and we're striving for that and giving it to God, living in that, and then we come together like this. And we experience order on a corporate level and peace. That is a a powerful thing for a bunch of people that are so different to come together and bring all the chaos, walking with Jesus in their everyday lives, and then coming on a corporate level to worship him. That's healing for your soul. There is nothing like the church because what the church is is a bunch of different people that might not be friends otherwise. Let's be honest. But because of the Holy Spirit and Jesus, we're connected. And what the world says is not meant to be united. God says otherwise. And there's order and there's peace in that and God works in every detail to do that in our lives, but to do that with our church family. So will you trust his details? Bring everything to him and let him work the details out. And then let's, let's do that together as a church family as well and see what God does as we continue to grow in Christ and reach this area with the gospel. Bow your heads for a minute. I want to pray for us. I want you to think about what God's saying to you right now and think about the details of your life, all the things you're worried about. I've got things on my mind, things that are out of my control, things I don't have answers to right now. And I know you're thinking of something as well. And God is not just concerned with the bigger things and the big picture. God is also concerned about the details. And God cares and God is there and he wants to help us bring 
order and peace. So God, as we respond, as we get ready to respond, I pray that you would help us, God, to take an honest look at our lives and just give you the details. Walk by faith, not by sight. Thank you, God, that you have a way of taking the most mundane things and doing something that only you can do with them. So God, as we reflect and worship, God, speak to us, help us to respond however you're leading. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.